in theory. Okay? So the, the word is conditioning or the term is conditioning. So the theory in general acknowledges that one learns by conditioning. We learn uh, a certain skill. We characterize a certain trait because at some point we were conditioned by our teacher to do such, to behave such, to learn such, or to develop such. Okay, so that is what um, classical conditioning is. When a stimulus, a particular st stimulus, is being associated to a particular response or vice versa. So stimulus response and response are very critical or the building blocks of what became known as the classical conditioning. The theory emerged um, after the experimentation of Pavlov. That was that experimentation involved um, a dog and then a bell and a food. So what happened during the experimentation? So on stage one, um, there was a, a bell, and then every time the bell rings, again, this is on stage one, every time the bell rings, um, there was no response, uh, there were no responses, or there is no response manifested by the dog. Because that was the start, that was the start of the experimentation. So what happens when conditioning um, emerged? So every time the bell, uh, the bell now is perfectly paired with a meat or the food. So during the condition, uh, conditioning, every time the bell um, rings, um, there is a particular food. So repeatedly until such time that a particular response coming from the dog emerged. So what was that response? That was salivation. So that was during the conditioning itself. Now, what happens after conditioning? So try to examine or try to see this illustration here. Um, every time the bell rings or when the bell rings and it's not being paired by food, still the dog is manifesting a particular response and that is through um, salivation. So that was an indication already that the conditioning had been taken uh, had, had been taking place successfully because even the, uh, even the absence of food because of the stimulus there is now a clear association between the response and the stimulus but that was during um, the stage 3 or after conditioning so in other words the conditioning itself is the most critical part of the process. It did not happen in one session, but it was series of series of conditioning until such that the dog, um, that such thing or the stimulus is now um, being conditioned to the dog. And of course, it's manifested by, by the salivation, which was the response of the dog. Okay. Now, on the findings of Pavlov, these are the different facets of the findings. So you have there the stimulus generalization, the extinction, spontaneous recovery, and um, discrimination and higher order conditioning. So stimulus generalization, um, even if it's going to be a different bell, but since it creates, um, if it has the same sound with the bell that had been used during the conditioning, the dog will still be able to manifest the same reaction because of the generalization. He genera the dog um, tended to generalize that every time, um, whatever bell would that be, if it's if he's gonna if the dog is going to list uh, to hear the same kind of sound, um, you know the same form of reaction will be manifested, and that was salivation. Okay. Extinction is that when when the bell, um, you know when Pavlov tried to ring the bell without the food, okay, so that uh, 
the reaction, another reaction made by the dog is that is that the dog no longer manifests that kind or that same reaction or response. Okay, that was extinction, meaning to say the conditioned response um, faded away already because of the change of the conditioning process. Okay, so that's critical also when we try to condition, when you try to condition your learners. If you're going to be um, changing, um, a bit of the process, then quite possibly certain kinds of responses will be changed or will be affected. Now, spontaneous recovery, okay, here. That response, that salivation can be recovered, okay, depending on the kind of interventions that you will undertake. But it will only be for a period of time. Eventually, um, it will fade away again, okay? Discrimination happens when after repeated or series of conditioning that take place um, for the bell, the food, um, the, 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 the dog here could already differentiate certain sounds. Is this the bell that has been used whenever there's going to be a food to be presented? Or is this the bell that, um, ha that was used when there was no food at all that has been presented that happened during extinction, okay? During the experimentation in which extinction emerged. Higher order, the key word there is discriminate. So when we discriminate, we tend to differentiate. The higher order conditioning is that it already involves another stimulus. So previously or initially, the only stimulus is the bell, that every time it rings, there is going to be a, uh, a food to be present. Uh, there is going to be a food. Now, what happens in higher conditioning, the experimentation involved another kind of stimulus. So as you can see here, every time the bell rings, um, there is going to be a flash of light that will occur. So because of that, um, well, the dog will, um, will salivate not just through the ring of the bell, but through um, a flash of light. So that's higher order conditioning when you are including another stimulus. So again, Conditioning is not just one session, it's not just one, one time, but it's going to be series of conditionings, series of tryouts, series of experimentations. So when you will try this out, do not just limit, uh, well, I have yet, I am not yet through reading the concept papers that you submitted, but in any case that you would like to test the theory, do not just limit yourself on ringing the bell and then there's going to be food explore further look for other stimulus or perhaps try it out that when you bell uh, when you ring the bell um there will be no food try to see if extinction happens or emerges on your own research subject okay next next theory would be about still on classical conditioning but this testing was done by john b watson on John V. Watson's tryout of the of Pavlov's classical conditioning theory, it involved um, a little boy or a, a young boy named Albert and um, a mouse, okay, or a white rat. So, what happened during Watson's um, testing of the classical conditioning theory? Can you say something to the class here? I would like to hear you talk about Watson's experimentation. Jonaline, Jonaline Dacilio. John. Or how about, yes, John. Eddie Rose Bukol. Eddie? Yes, 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Hi, Eddie. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, sir. It's okay, sir. Okay. So, right. Um, that's good. Right now, Eddie, I want you um, to to tell me how did Watson um, try or test the theory of um, classical conditioning. Um, Watson tried this classical conditioning theory, sir, by um, a child is not in, is not afraid of the rat, but every time, every time, um, every time, so many, every time Albert, every time there's a rat, then. Albert Watson, I, there's a loud noise, sir. Okay. Every time there's a rat, then the child will <laughs> later on later on become afraid or have fear to the rat, sir, even without noise. Okay, so, all right. So, as you can see, um, don't go, um, I have follow-up questions to you, Ro, uh, Eddie. So initially, the boy named Albert was not afraid of white rat, okay? So what made Albert here eventually became afraid of the white rat? Why? How did fear emerge? Because fear there is the reaction, right? The response. So why? What happened? Because every time... Um he touched the rat, there's always a sudden loud noise, sir. Mm. Then, okay. the, so uh, in the, other words, that, that, in other words, sir, um, Albert beca became afraid of the rat. Anyway, um, in other words, um, the the sound there was the stimulus okay the sound there was the stimulus and because of that stimulus the reaction is that from not being afraid of white rat to eventually becoming afraid of white rat because that um that sound was frightening or strange um on the part of albert correct okay so here um Watson managed to test it and had the same kind of uh, the same kinds of findings. But the implication now is that here, this is now the implication of the classical conditioning theory. Um, it's good when we are going to condition uh, our it's gonna be good when you're gonna be conditioning your future students to um to develop among themselves. For example, a particular skill or a particular trait. Like you want to condition them on, you know, developing themselves the study habit. Okay? So you will do the same. Condition them, blah, blah, blah. But it's not going to be... The other aspect of classical conditioning is that um, the negative feelings, the negative reactions like fears... So fear in itself can be learned, okay? The same with what happened to um, Watson's tryout of the experimentation. So the child was not afraid of white rat, but because of the kind of experimentation um, Watson did, fear emerged, fear developed. So fears among your future adolescent teachers, um, sorry, adolescent students, will emerge depending on the kind of conditioning that you are going to implement among, uh, in your classroom. But nevertheless, that kind of negative feeling can be unlearned. So that depends now on, your, uh, on the kind of interventions that you are going to make. But then again, um, the unlearning of such negative feeling that your students feel like, for example, in your own classroom, cannot just be unlearned um, anytime or in one day. So it's the same kind, the same amount of conditioning that you're going to do. 
Okay? So, the unlearning will take time. Um, it, the same with conditioning itself. So, that's it. Okay, next. The theory here is about um, Edward Lee Thorndike's laws of learning. So, what are the different laws of learning? Now, Thorndike, the Thorndike's theory was known to be connectionism, okay? Now, let's um, apply at, uh, directly here the theory in terms of learning. So, because, um, because of that, Thorndike was able to formulate the different laws of learning. So, how do these laws of learning work? Here's the thing, class. If the learner or the individual is not ready to learn a particular task, then the entire process of teaching or learning that said task for the individual will really be affected negatively. Okay? So because it, um, and then the effect will be at stake, whether the effect could be satisfying or dissatisfying. So example, in a real life situation, if you are going to be forcing a preschooler or a first grader to know how to read and then he or she is not yet ready to learn how to read, then um, the process of learning how to read on the child will take much time, will not be pleasurable. The entire experience will be negative because in the very first place, the child was not ready at all to learn. And because of that, the effect will be unsatisfying or dissatisfying. In other words, motivation is very important for the child before learning, um, before, you know, letting him learn or letting her learn the skill that you want him or her to learn. So readiness is the first stage and very critical. Okay, so here, well, as soon as... Um, readiness is ensured then the reaction or the stimulus and the, the connection between stimulus and reaction will be positive which then became a habit okay so the thing is that how do we connect positively the stimulus and the response that is a response desired response then that is going to be what the law of readiness states the individual must be ready so how can and uh, how can the individual be ready? First, motivated. Second, well equipped. Okay. So for example, you are gonna be teaching multiplication among children. So uh, here you're gonna be teaching division among the children. So what are indications that children are not yet ready to learn division if they did not master yet? the skill of multiplication right so imagine if they are not if they were um if they did not master multiplication and then you you wanted them to learn division because you wanted them to be advanced or you're lagging or uh, you're getting behind already in terms of your um learning or teaching materials then definitely the child will find division very very difficult because they do not know yet or they did not master yet what multiplication is, okay? So learning is a step-by-step -step process. And for us to connect very well stimulus and response, then readiness must be taking place, okay? So that's it. Next. Now let's proceed to Skinner's operant conditioning. The focus of Skinner's theory is about um, reinforcement. So what are reinforcements? Reinforcements are there to strengthen a particular response. Okay? So you, uh, for example, what are these reinforcements? These could be um, a positive reinforcer or a negative reinforcer. So these are rewards. So how do we strengthen a particular response when we are on the verge of conditioning the learners so that 
uh, that's by, that is going to be through reward systems, right? Right, that's the most common thing. So positive reinforcer, these are um, intensifying further or increasing the response. So practically, these are rewards. But what is a negative reinforcer? A negative reinforcer is that you are um, removing something on the reward system. So you are just, if in positive reinforcer, you are intensifying further the, the reward system or the reinforcement, you are adding something to it, then what happens in negative reinforcer is that you are um, delimiting something or you are removing something from what you have added on the positive reinforcer. But a negative reinforcer is absolutely different from a punishment. Because in punishment, the goal of punishment is to cut a certain kind of response, okay? To eliminate a certain kind of response. Say, for example, um, this is in connection now to one learns by observation. So the child is carefully um, observing the mother putting makeup on her face. So the child was observing the mother and then secretly, when the mother was not around, the child imitated the behavior that the mother modeled, and that was putting makeup on the face. Now, other mothers would find it funny, okay, would find it, would find the imitation as a good thing, but there are mothers in real life who would be feeling, um, you know, disgusted all about it because perhaps the I'm saying that nag sa ba nang nang hilabot na po dang bata or unsa ba giguba guba na sad ang makeup whatever so because of that imagine the mother scolding the little girl of imitating the behavior or putting makeup on the face so because of that there is going to be a punishment to happen and because of that punishment that kind of imitation that kind of response that the little girl manifested after carefully observing the mother doing such thing will weaken and eventually fade away. That depends on the degree of the punishment involved. So again, the rationale of punishment is to weaken or fade out a certain kind of reaction or response, okay, from a particular stimulus. Negative, um, positive reinforcer is intensifying the kind of response, the certain response, and that is adding something or intensifying further the reward system. A negative reinforcer is um, removing something from the reinforcer, but then again, it's still a reinforcer, okay? So again, negative reinforcer is absolutely different from punishment because a negative reinforcer is still a reinforcer, but a punishment is not a reinforcer at all. Its intention is to weaken or kill a particular um, response. All right. Next. So the shaping of the behavior, this is now conditioning is taking place and then reinforcement is taking place. And then behavioral chaining, these are the sequence of steps um, that, are un that are being undertaken in order for conditioning to successfully, uh, to successfully happen um, by the help or with the, uh, with the aid of um, certain reinforcements, okay? Now you have the, uh, here a reinforcement schedule. This is in connection to what we call as behavioral chaining. So reinforcement schedule can be further um, can be further understood um, with this. So try to examine this next slide here. So you have here the fixed interval schedule, the variable interval schedule, and then the fixed ratio schedule and variable ratio schedule. So what happens in the fixed interval schedule is that here. 
the response is being reinfo reinforced after a fixed amount of time. So from uh, as you can see here, the bird in a cage is given food every 10 minutes. So that every 10 minutes there is the fixed amount of time for the reinforce, uh, reinforcement. Now, let's pair the fixed interval schedule with the fixed ratio schedule. Because in fixed ratio schedule, um, a fixed number of correct responses must occur before a reinforcement may occur. So for example, the bird will be given um, food every time it presses um, five, um, presses the bar five times. So the fixed ratio schedule is the fixed response. Fixed interval schedule is the fixed stimulus. Okay? Now, so they are, the stimulus is being given or being activated in a particular fixed time. So in connection with that, the fixed ratio schedule, um, a certain kind of response is getting fixed or, or these are the fixed responses that being manifested out from a particular stimulus, most likely fixed stimulus. Now, variable interval schedule, the bird may receive food in different intervals. So every 10 minutes, every 5 minutes, so there is going to be an interval um, along the way. Now, let's pair that one with variable ratio schedule. The bird is given food after it presses the bar three times, then after 10 times, then after four times. So when you are already intensifying the reinforcement or the, the response or the stimulus, then you are going to be proceeding to variable interval schedule. And then in connection with that for the response, the variable ratio schedule. Okay? So fixed is that the amount of time is fixed for both the stimulus and then the response. So that's why you have fixed interval schedule and fixed ratio schedule. Now, when you are going to intensify that one further by making intervals with the time, so every 10 minutes and then every five minutes and then every four minutes, so that's going to be a uh, variable interval schedule on the part of the stimulus and variable ratio schedule on the part of the response, okay? So this is how reinforcement works. Nevertheless, reinforcement is a building block or a very important element when we are doing conditioning. It just so happened that the focus of Skinner is on reinforcement, okay? So that's it. So, well, it is still a mystery if Pavlov was able, because during Pavlov's experimentation on classical conditioning, he did not specify the kind of reinforcements that he did um, to the dog, okay? He did not document it very well, those reinforcements. But, um, analo, uh, well, when we are do uh, when we think about this, clearly, uh, most definitely, there were um, reinforcements done during the conditioning because conditioning will not successfully happen if there are no reinforcements. So this is what the implication of Skinner is. Um, in doing conditioning, there must be reinforcements that will involve. Nevertheless. A punishment is not a reinforcement, okay? It's not even a negative reinforcer because the goal of punishment is to weaken a response. Okay. Here, next. Neo-behaviorism. Neo-behaviorism class is still um, the theories of neo-behaviorism are the following, the one by Tolman and the one by Bandura. Okay. They are still behaviorist theories, but they some sort of um, gave a bit of importance to cognitivism or the thought or mental making process. Okay, so here.
let's take a look into this um, exper experimentation made by Tolman because the facet of Tolman's theory is that learning is always purposive and goal oriented. Meaning to say, there is always a rationale or a reason why we are learning something, right? So even if learning sometimes is a painful process and learning most definitely in the context of human development, a sequence or an orderly process, but the essence of it, there must be an essence of it. There must be a reason of it. So there must be a reason why we, at some point, we were learning about C squared equals A squared plus B squared or the Pythagorean theorem, okay? So the implication is that as facilitators of learning, um, in the very first place, you must be able to make your teaching purposive on the part of the learners, okay? And learning in connection of having purposes must be goal-oriented. What's the end result of learning this one? So right now, I'm really thinking, what was the real or the goal of learning the Pythagorean theorem? The C squared equals A squared plus B squared, okay? Or learning the algebraic expression or the equations at all, okay? So that's the reason why at this point, I believe that you have gone through a couple of teaching demonstrations already and classroom observations. And if you notice, um, before the teaching process is being implemented, objectives must be presented to the students. That's how it works, right? Because these objectives are the goals, not just by the teacher, but for the students. That's why um, it's being said, um, by the end of uh, by the end of the discussion that uh, the, the class must have or these are the following um, outcomes that they need to attain so that's how Tolman's facet uh, theory is being translated in the actual teaching okay. so let's take a look into this um, experimentation done by Tolman so here Try for a moment, I want you to examine carefully the experimentation and tell me something about it. Miss Davis, yes, sir. Hello, good evening to you. So, um, try to examine or please examine here the experimentation of Tolman and tell me something about it. What was the experimentation about? Kadali lang sir, hawit lang basa sa nako sir. Hey, go on. Keep your time. Uh, Miss Davis, tell me whenever you're ready, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, anyway, I'll just be the, uh, I'll just take it from here, okay? Yes, sir. Then I'm going to give uh, to ask a follow-up question. So in the experimentation class, this is what happened. Um, there is a maze, okay? A maze. Now, um, there were uh, there were two groups of rats. First group, okay, they were in different starting points of the maze. But then again, the food in which which is which was their goal 
is placed in the same location. So the first group, the rats were in different starting points of the maze, but the food is placed in the same location. The second group is that the food is placed in different locations, okay? So the food is distributed in different locations. But then again, the rats were, this, were having the same patterns for the food, okay? So in the experimentation involving two groups of rats, Tolman found out that the first group performed better compared to the second group. So, why is it so that the first group performed better? So, what's your idea about that, Ms. Davis? Sa kwa, sir, kay ang first group ang kay mas mas nindot sila o strategy nga ma-complete nila ang goal nga katong ang food kay mabutang sa sa kanak nga location mas ano sila, sir, mas nindot sila o kanang Tanda, mas hindi sila strategy, mas hindi sila o kanang burag ilhang pangunahon na sir ba kay burag lawak ka ayo kay lawak ka ayo kay para maka maka construct maka perform sila an ang strategy kana lang sir. Okay, so I like the word. Thank you, Miss Davis. I like the word strategy. Or in in the case of theories class, psychologically, we're calling that one as cons. Uh, um, here, cognitive mapping. Cognitive, cognitive mapping is like an instinct class that before you're going to undertake the process, um, the process has been framed already into your mind so that you would be able to act it out smartly or wisely. So that's what cognitive mapping is. Um, the process is in your head already and because of that, um, you can always um, perform better during the uh, uh, perform better on that process wisely because um, it has been framed already in your mind. So you would be able to strategize further, blah blah blah. So here, the first group perform better because the common the outcome the goal is very clear to all of the rats, even if they were placed in different starting points. And at the same time, the the, the goal is placed uh, is being under is placed in the same location that rats could man, could reach anytime. Okay, so claro ang goal para sa mga rats, even if in even if they're in the same uh, in different starting points. Most probably they are in this in different um pacing. Pero pag ang goal, if the goal, the implication is that if the goal is not clear to all of the learners, say for example, then the process of achieving the goal or the outcomes itself will be varied. Will uh you know, the process itself will not be that successful. And that is definitely true when you are going to facilitate a learner-centered teaching. Regardless of the developmental, uh, regardless of the pacing of your learners, but the most important thing that you need to ignite is an understanding, a consensus understanding of what the goal is. So that because each of the learners will have their own cognitive mapping as to how to achieve the goal, okay? So unlike the second group here, their cognitive mapping are very scattered because the goal, the food itself, is being scattered into different places. So it's like they were working without, have, without knowing what the goal is. That's it. Next, even if they are reaching out foods, but they don't know what they're, the essence of what they're doing, the purpose of what they're doing. So that is why the facet of Antolman's theory is learning must be purposive and at the same time goal-oriented. Not just goal-oriented, but really purposive, okay? The same kind with what the first group, uh, the first group of rat, rats did. 
they're purposive because they know that their goal is to have that food which is placed in the same location. Okay? Next. So you have here um, latent learning. Now, a kind of learning that remains or stays with the individual until it is needed. So um, the latent learning, these are the learnings that we only retrieve um, once it's going to be needed. But the thing is that it is already within us, okay? Now, intervening variables, these are um, variables that will, that will distract the process of learning at all. So you're, you're seeing that one there. And then reinforcement, um, which is not essential for learning. So here. That's one of the findings of um, Tolman that it's not about reinforcement, but um, here. These are the, the cognitive mapping itself. Okay. Now, the second theory, which is the last theory, is about Bandura's social learning theory. So according to Bandura, if classical conditioning theory claims that one learns by associating or conditioning, Bandura's theory is much more about one learns by imitation or observation. So because of that one, this is the process that Bandura uh, framed. It all started with attention. When the learner is carefully and critically observing a model, okay? Now, a model could be live modeling, verbal instruction modeling, or symbolic modeling. So live modeling, the person is personally, or the child or the individual is personally observing someone doing a certain behavior. Verbal instruction, when the behavior is not being demonstrated but being instructed verbally. Symbolic behavior uh, modeling is when, um, when the individual is observing not a real person but someone in the television or using any other media, okay? So that's symbolic modeling. So attention is the first step. And then the second stage is that when a certain behavior has been, uh, has been stored already into the minds of the individual. Reproduction happens when imitation is being manifested. So when the individual tends to imitate or produce the same um, behavior that he or she recently observed from the model. Motivation is when the individual tends to repeat the same kind of behavior, okay? But punishment here will weaken the motivation because if the individual is being punished for reproducing such kind of behavior, then the, in the individual will not be motivated to do it, to do it, okay? There are behaviors that are good for the individual to imitate or in the context of children that are good for children to imitate. But there are certain behaviors that must be stopped because it's not good for the individual to behave. So that's why observation is very critical and modeling is very critical as well for the learners, more importantly for children. Okay, so that's it. So here. 